Thank you. It's good to see you all. Can I just um, get a sense of how many of you are students here? And how many of you are pastors or working in church staff positions or mission organizations in the area too? Okay, so I assume that some of those hands were the same person, so that's good to know too. Um, I'm going to take you on to a little journey over the next hour that um, began in my own life about a decade ago um, in the field of leadership um, when I realized that uh, pastors and Christian leaders of organizations were often finding themselves at a loss to find the Bible all that useful for the pressing needs of management and leadership and were regularly going to the trough of secular leadership theorists and practitioners to get their best takeaways. And I realized that in some ways we had failed, uh, those of us that were in seminaries generally, but also for me particularly in the field of Bible, to realize that we hadn't really necessarily helped people understand the Bible as a resource for every aspect of ministry. We taught people how to exegete, we taught people how to make sermons out of their good exegetical work, but I could see very clearly that when it came to conflict management, strategic planning, to having any positive view of administration and the management of ministry, we hadn't made very many contributions. So I wanted to look into uh, the field, uh, quite literally, to get some background on the Bible's uh, persistent and reoccurring usage of shepherd, author by author, period by period, Old and New Testament. Why is it that the shepherd seems to be so commonly used throughout the Bible and the biblical periods, even to the point where, as a metaphor, it's used by people who aren't themselves uh, necessarily uh, in the business of shepherding and even in a world where shepherding is held in high esteem. Why would it be so resilient? So I want to talk about this uh, not only to make this kind of contribution explicit, again, uh, having witnessed it in Scripture and seen its value in the lives of pastors and those that are in Christian ministry in different settings, but um, I also believe that we probably, uh, in pastoral ministry more than any other field, need to be able to hit a reset button uh, regularly uh, on our identity because there are, uh, there are categories into which what we do fits, um, but the, the mix of things that we do in pastoral ministry is a unique mix. And it's a, a certain kind of vocation which in the history of the United States at a, at a point in time had a great deal of honor attributed to it, prestige, respect, like it is in some cultures today. But we're at a point where not only is it difficult to sustain a coherent view of what it means to be a shepherd, but we're living at a time when a lot of other people have ideas about what you ought to do with your time. And it's, it includes, obviously, people who see themselves as your employers. So this is an important, and I, I assume, an undisputed need that we need an enduring kind of uh, pastoral identity and that the most obvious place to look would be at the shepherd because, in fact, our word pastor is just a translation of the word shepherd and we probably could have avoided a lot of difficulties in the English-speaking world a long time ago if we had stuck with the word shepherd instead of taking a Latin word and making something else out of it, some other title, so that we could almost uh, find ourselves creating a redundant expression like shepherding pastors, at least if you say shepherding leaders, shepherd leadership, it doesn't sound quite so redundant, but it would. It would in the ancient world. Shepherd is another way of saying leader, and it's another way of saying pastor. It's a concrete, metaphorical way. So I want to take you back with me to a sabbatical I did in 2003-2004 to, to come with me into the world uh, where... I could have access to some extent to the life and work of, of shepherds, mostly in Jordan, Egypt, to some extent in uh, southern Israel, but 
for the most part, that lifestyle has changed so much there's not much of a vestige left of anything that would have cultural continuity over the centuries. But I want you to come into the tent. I want you to meet some people, some of whom uh, are old enough to be able to tell stories about when they were children and the stories they heard from their grandparents that get you back into the 19th century where you really could have cultural continuity. There really was a great degree of constancy in the world of uh, tribal shepherds. Whether they had camels or goats or sheep, basically the geography hasn't changed, the lifestyle didn't change that much until the advent of more industrialized uh, elements of society, civilization, and then of course in the more recent era, the division of the boundaries of the lands in the Middle East, which are all part of the last 100 years, and then with the advent of technology, water trucks, grain trucks, all available by satellite cell phone, there's hardly anything left. So there's, there's a, a curtain dropping on a lifestyle that has just a little bit left of a lifestyle to show you what took place for millennia. This woman, by the way, was 100 years old, and she could tell me what it was like when she was eight or nine and, and sort of tug me back underneath that curtain into that world. Now, of course, interviewing shepherds is not like having class, this, this is the world that you sort of enter to say, well, so tell me what it's like to be a shepherd. So it took a year and it took uh, a while to figure out the best way to do the interviewing. I just want to introduce you to uh, one, one Bedouin, Abu Jamal, I'll call him, uh, who invited me back more than once. He took a lot of pride in his, his shepherding practice, you might say. He didn't grow up with it. And that's typically the case in Bedouin, which are uh, the native tribal groups in the Middle East, didn't grow up with it. He had actually gone to the military, and when he came out, he wanted to become a shepherd. And he took on the lifestyle quite deliberately, and he was very proud of the fact that he had grown his congregation to 2,000. Okay, talk just like a pastor. I started in 1986, and now I have 2,000 head. <laughs> okay. And he said, you know what? My sons aren't going to inherit this flock because they don't have the heart for it. He understood my questions. We're trying to get at his world, his work, the mentality that goes with it. And, and, and I wasn't trying to just say, here's John 10, what do you think it means? Here's the parable of the lost sheep, what do you think it means? I was trying to figure out that world in a way that would make it possible for me to hear afresh what the Bible says. And in his own words, he was saying to me, you don't belong out here with these sheep unless you have the heart for it. He said, I've got 2,000 head of sheep and goats. He said, I've got two wives. They each have their own homes. And he said, I don't need to be out here with my flock. I've got hired hands that help me. But he said, if I weren't out here every day with them, I wouldn't deserve to be their shepherd. And he said, when I look at my sons, they see it as a business only. And they don't belong out here. And I was thinking about Jeremiah's words. Jeremiah, God says, through Jeremiah, and Jeremiah 3.15, I will give you shepherds after my own heart who will lead you with skill and understanding or knowledge and understanding. This was one of many occasions when I heard somebody speaking in Arabic, listened to a translator, and I felt like God was opening up his word afresh to me in English. Give me somebody with the right heart and then we can train them. He said, if you have the right heart for it, you can start tomorrow. Uh, my son is on uh, your right. He's now uh, six foot four and he's in college, but at the time, Abu Jamal looked at my son and he said, you know, I think your son has the heart for it. He said, why don't you tell him that if he wants to come and live with me, he can have 200 head of sheep to get started. I'll give him a wife. I'll give him a Jordanian education. Tell me what he wants. Tell me, tell me what his answer is. <laughs> so I took my, uh, after my son heard the translation of the question, we, we, we bought some time. And then, of course, as you can imagine, my son um, tried to politely decline before the day was out. Well, I'll never know whether or not the offer was good. Um, or if my son, maybe now, now that he actually is in a study abroad program, might wish that he had actually taken up that offer when he was only 12 years old. But I do, remember the, I do remember the question, I remember the kind of passion that 
really echoed the passion that I hear in heaven. Who's got the heart to take care of my flock? If they have the heart for it, then I can train them. They can begin tomorrow. If they don't have the heart for it, they don't have any business with my business. So my job was to think like a shepherd and think like a sheep. That's what I'm going to ask you to do with me today. 2003 was also when I got Photoshop. So as you can imagine, I came back from the field and had a little fun with my furry animal pictures. Okay. I'm going, to, I'm going to return, in a sense, with you to Psalm 23, the place where you would likely have begun. It would have been either John 10 or Psalm 23 where you first thought about God as the shepherd, maybe Psalm 100, but probably not Ezekiel 34, probably not some other places where the imagery is still quite profound. But I return to Psalm 23, having been on the field long enough to be able to reread it. And what I find in it is... Uh, a kind of rubric or a series of themes or categories that pretty well uh, contain all the aspects of shepherding, provision, protection, and guidance. The psalm begins, uh, you could translate it, because the Lord is my shepherd, I have everything that I want, everything that I need, or literally, I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures, leads me beside still waters. I want to show you some images from the world of pastoralists in the Middle East today to kind of illustrate this and to put it in perspective. And I'll start and end with a simple statement. If you want to take notes, the rest of it's all pictures. But if you want to take notes, God's looking for compassionate and nurturing shepherds who sustain his people with provision. So when you think about provision, think about it as an environment, a culture that shepherds create, an environment of sustenance, of supply, of plenty, and that requires a heart of compassion. We're going to talk about heart in more than one way, but a compassionate, nurturing heart. Now, probably this is the kind of image that comes to your mind when you think about Psalm 23. And in fact, this is a picture from the Middle East but it's a rare one. Sheep are not usually lying down in green pastures. As a matter of fact, this is normally what you see. And let me just ask, how many of you have been on a trip to at least Israel? Okay, you've probably seen where the sheep and goats are when you force the bus driver to stop and you all want to take pictures. And it was probably in the wilderness somewhere where you all were asking each other, what are they eating, right? It's all brown, no grass, unless you happen to go in the wintertime, perhaps the spring, when there had been enough rain, and maybe even just on one side of the hills there was green grass. But for the most part, the shepherds are leading them to places where there is uh, pasture. Maybe they've had to rent the rights to that pasture. But this may help explain one difference between shepherding in the Middle East and in places like Great Britain and New Zealand and Australia and other places where People think of shepherding as sort of opening the gate, and then you sort of follow behind these happily feeding fat sheep who don't seem to lack for anything to eat. And you go to the Middle East and you see these scrawny animals that are following someone who actually knows where there's something to eat or drink. And so let me just uh, underscore kind of subtlety about the shepherd image that's true of our lives and our environments as well, and that is that we are called to prepare a banquet in an inhospitable environment. We, we feed like God feeds us in an environment that's not suited to plenty, to prosperity. It's the shepherd who has the heart and the knowledge, the commitment, the resilience to actually bring you to places in that barren landscape where you can feast, where he can lay a table before you. Here's a goat chewing on uh, the national bird of Jordan, which is black plastic trash, okay? A photographer was once trying to take a picture of an acacia tree, and every time he got behind the tripod, he kept seeing these black plastic bags on the tree, and then he'd go out and try to take the bags off the tree. Then he'd get behind the camera, and there they were again. They just, they're always on the trees because they blow out of the, uh, of the more settled areas. Um, 
but I talked to a veterinarian, and she said the most common operation we do on goats is to, is to take black plastic bags out of the guts of uh, goats. Well, just think about this environment. It's an environment that's not only inhospitable. In other words, the natural resources aren't just waiting for you, oh, fling open the gates and let them graze, but it also has poisonous or at least... Uh, some things that are bad to eat or some things that you shouldn't eat at a given time. For example, if it's an annual crop, you want to wait till it's ready before you take it. Uh, you, if it's perennial, you want to make sure the goats don't pull up the roots and you never have it again. There's some things that are medicinal, but they may not be good for some animals at a certain time. But think about the image of browsing. Browsing. Animals are out there and they're in this environment that's mostly rock, dirt, an occasional greenery, and of that greenery, not all of it's good for you. This starts to give you an idea of why the image of sheep and shepherd is so useful to describe humans. And I'll just say right at the front end of this presentation, the Bible never says people are like sheep because they're stupid. That's the most common thing people say about shepherd imagery when they hear it. The Bible never says that. But we are like sheep in that we need to be fed. And as I'll say later, we're also easily misled. Those are characteristics that the Bible does sort of hold on to, author by author, period by period. But we do, whether it's through a remote or through our mouse or our, you know, our keyboards, we browse. We're feeding ourselves all the time. And we get in trouble by what we ingest. Well, I'll just say briefly the same thing's true about water. This is probably the kind of image that would make a nice illustration for uh, a uh, Bible story book. My wife reminded me the other day of the book we read to our kids when they were little, The Bible um, Through Children's Eyes, I think it's called, kind of a little oblong book, and it had all these pictures uh, that don't represent Middle Eastern realities at all, but that's what sort of fed our imaginations when we were kids. But this is the kind of picture that you'd think of, right? I've only seen one picture like this. <laughs> it's, it's a fabulous picture of what hardly ever happens. It's, it's the still waters after a storm. And you've got this huge wide open valley where the water has just come like torrents through the hills out into this open space and then the sky goes calm, the waters are still, nobody else has access to the water, no one's fighting for it and you just let the animals drink until they're sated. <clears throat> One of the words that's often used in shepherding passages is satisfaction. In Psalm it says, I, I lack nothing. But, that, but lack nothing is sort of a, a neutral. But the idea of plenty, the idea of satisfaction, it gets picked up later with the idea of he restores my soul. This is what's more commonly the case. If you want water, you get to dig for it. This, this guy was telling me how they dug 30 feet <clears throat> with hand tools because they understood the terrain enough to understand that there was certain vegetation that had to have moisture, must be there. They dug 30 feet. Now, ironically, the desert is a place where the Arabs say of the three things that they fear most, one is drought and another is flood. You pray most that you would get rain, and then you pray next, make sure when it rains, it's during the day, because when it's at night, we have no idea where it is, where it's coming from, and where it's going to hit. And we also want to make sure that we are ready. There's, there's a terror in the desert when it rains. So just let this highlight the fact that the environment in which sheep and goats are raised is an environment that is not, uh, it's not inviting these flock animals to meet their needs. It's the shepherd who has the commitment and the knowledge to go into that environment and to find it, to make sure they're protected. In case it doesn't rain, he knows where there's cisterns hidden, where there's wells, he's negotiated for rights. When it does rain, he makes sure they're not in the, in the open valley where they can get swept away. 
And this will take us to the most obvious application that runs throughout the Bible, and that is that food in the Bible is constantly a metaphor for God's word. That feeding is a metaphor for teaching. Jesus saw a large crowd and had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And this is in Mark's version where he says, so he began teaching them many things. Jesus appeared in places that Mark calls desert. And if you went there today, you'd never say they're desert. All around the Galilee, these are places that are wide open fields. But Mark chooses a nice ambivalent term to help capture the Old Testament association with God providing in the desert, providing food, Jesus feeding multitudes like God fed multitudes, only to then equate it with the word of God, which was available for them. And so just briefly, I'll take this first topic to a close with this idea that for people to be restored, for people to have their needs met, above all else, among all the things that we do, they need to be fed. The best food of all, the most organic, wholesome, natural food is God's Word. Inspirationals, hymns, all kinds of other things which draw from Scripture, good soul food. The further we get away from it, the more it may satisfy our curiosity, our special interests. But we also start to move further and further away into some things that can become substitutes, that claim our attention. And that's the world that we minister in, a world into which Jesus sent Peter. He said, if you love me, feed my sheep. If you love me, take care of my sheep. If you love me, feed my sheep. Different words for sheep, different words for love, different words for, for feed. But the first and third time, he says feed, Bosco. He doesn't say shepherd. He really drives it home, framing those three statements with feed them, Peter. Almost, and of course, there's a, there's a kind of echo here of Peter's three denials but there does seem to be a way in which Jesus is deferring on Peter's sentiment and channeling it to what matters most to Jesus. After all, Jesus was saying, I'm leaving. And I'm leaving you in charge. If you really love me, take care of my sheep. My wife and I are uh, away from home this week, and my youngest is a 17-year-old at home. And if she stood at the door and said, you know, Dad, I know you're going away. I just want you to know I love you. You know, I, I'd, lo I'd like to hear that. It warms my heart. But if I say to her, Adrian, you realize that while I'm gone, the best way to show that you love me is to make sure that at the end of the day, the house is clean that you don't let other people come in here and trash the place and that you don't abuse some of the rules that we have in place when we are here. If you love me, you'll hear some other things beside wish me well, send me a text. I love all those things, of course. It's not as though Jesus was saying, don't talk about love, but he was saying, Peter, we've got to translate your affection for me, even your remorse, if this is what's going on, even your remorse, we've got to translate it back down into what captivated me. Jesus saw people like sheep without a shepherd, and he's saying, Peter, you've got to take over for me, and that means feeding them. Now, there's lots of other topics, and maybe I'll just take a commercial break here to explain a couple of things. When I did my research, I did it... Uh, with a contract in mind with the New Studies in Biblical Theology series that Don Carson edits. And out of it came an exegetical journey through the Bible called Shepherds After My Own Heart. So there's a lot in here that's background for sermons, for Bible study, and for giving you the, probably the deepest level of grounding for pastoral identity. The subtitle is Pastoral Traditions and Leadership in the Bible. When I came back, in the ensuing years, I found myself doing seminars like this. 
showing pictures like these. And I found that people were interested in something uh, more mobile than a seminar that they could take and walk more slowly through. So I have another book called While Shepherds Watch Their Flocks, which is a 40-day uh, incremental journey into the life and work of shepherds that follows the pattern of this presentation, provision, protection, and guidance. So I'm just saying that now because feeding is only one of the ways that we express our compassionate provision. We look for the lost. We name. We have intimate knowledge. Let me just read to you from one chapter that I won't, so one topic that I won't go into under provision has to do with being named and known. The mothers, this is a quote from a, a, a shepherding family. The mothers, referring to the animals now, which number 51, 42 sheep and nine goats, were kept back from the lambs by Falah and Salim, where, while Nasir began to call them by name. And as each was allowed to come up, Nasir slipped the noose off the young one's neck and gave it to the mother. He knew every mother and every lamb. The astounding thing was that he called up each ewe and picked out her lamb in complete darkness. All through the process of loosing the lambs, calling up the mothers, and handing the baby to its mother to suckle, he was calling out name after name amidst the din of mothers, crying, crying lambs, baaing mothers. To me it was pandemonium. To Nasir and Falah it was everyday procedure. He could recognize each mother and each baby by the feel with his eyes shut. All were black, but by feeling heads and backs, he knew by touch which was which. So there's lots more uh, about provision than feeding, but if there's one direct connection the Bible makes between the providing shepherd and spiritual leadership, it is that we feed people God's word. I don't know if you're familiar with the statistics on biblical illiteracy in this country, but Protestants aren't doing any better than Catholics. In fact, people that are agnostic and atheist are sometimes in some studies ranking higher than people in Christian faith traditions. Their curiosity about what they're fairly sure they don't believe has brought them further along in terms of their Bible awareness than people that populate churches, even those that consider themselves evangelical. There is a lot of work to do. I saw on your website the kind of free theological education you make available. A lot of seminaries are doing that. We have a Bible journey program, part of a biblical literacy project. We need all hands on deck. If we think some people don't have a tolerance for God's word, we're going to have to build a taste for it. And that takes time because people have to be detoxified from the addicted uh, kind of taste that they have. Just like all natural food doesn't taste good to somebody that's addicted to stuff that's high in sugar, high in fat, high processed stuff, you're not going to get somebody to give up an energy drink for a glass of grape juice right away. But if you purge your body physically and go through that period of cold turkey, you can get to the point where, like a Bedouin, there's nothing sweeter than a fig, nothing sweeter than a date, nothing sweeter than grape syrup or juice. Our bodies naturally crave those things that are good, but they've been corrupted, they've been co-opted, and we have learned as a society to find other things that satisfy the soul. So you add that to kind of an ADHD kind of a um, culture that we continually keep reinforcing by shorter commercials, shorter messages, shorter packaging, and by multiple forms of Im input. We have our work cut out for us, but I certainly hope that we keep in mind that it's feeding people God's word that has the best long-term benefits. And one of the great ironies to me when I look at pastoral ministry is how many people have been sustained spiritually by sermons that may not be any longer than a half an hour once a week. I can't believe how many people in hospitals find encouragement from messages they've heard, from portions of scripture they've read, even if it was only our daily bread for two or three minutes in the morning. 
That just shows you how much power it has when so much else in our world is calling for our attention and absorbing our energies. God's word, even in little bits, has had a huge impact on us. Well, let me move to the second topic. And with that, I'm going to use some, uh, some implements, okay? I'd like to suggest that the provision of the shepherd, especially the compassionate presence of the shepherd, who looks for the lost, who heals, who knows how to mend a broken leg, who knows the sheep because from the day uh, before they were born, through labor, into birth, through every sickness was with them, that that's sort of summed up in a way by the staff, which is very often, and of course not so much today, they, they might not have anything that looks like this in many places. But when you see shepherds that are standing like this, it's, it's a kind of a signal to the sheep that the shepherd's present. But not just physically present. He's attentive. He's there for you. This could be used for a newborn. It could be used for a sick one. But what I want to encourage you to, to think about right now, I, I want you to sort of cross a hinge with me into another dimension of shepherding, which is not as popular and is often relegated to another person or another position. And that is the protective shepherd. And that's symbolized by the rod. And I'm gonna hand, hand these around for you all to just feel what this is like. These are made out of wild olive wood. And these two are not used today, except um, I have them made in Eastern Africa where the Maasai still use them, although they don't use them in, in olive wood. But I wanted, to, I wanted to have something that might have been something like David had. Remember, David went to the, to, the, uh, to the confrontation with Goliath, and we remember the stones, but remember, Goliath said to him, who is this, this young uh, boy who comes to me with his sticks? David came to him with his shepherding implements, not with Saul's armor, which didn't fit quite symbolically. But it wasn't as though he was weaponless. The slingshot proved that, but I'll let you... When you feel the rod, I want you to be thinking about this other side of pastoral identity. And I'll just say right up front, I think that uh, there are several misconceptions about shepherding when we associate it with pastoral leadership. Uh, one of them is that it only refers to abusive authority, in which case the rod is sort of the perfect emblem, and people don't want to have any part of it. You know, we live in a democratic and egalitarian kind of milieu where we wouldn't expect that. Some people think sheep are dumb, and that's what we're trying to say when we talk about it. Other people have associated shepherding with high accountability groups. Or... But one of the things that I hear very commonly, and it's actually enshrined institutionally in some denominations and in some parachurch ministries, the word shepherding is equivalent to counseling, personal care, or what you might call sort of the the, uh, the open-hearted side, the, the, the nurturing side of leadership only. In fact, I hear pastors come into our doctor of ministry program and will often say, my church is trying to turn me into a business leader. They're trying to turn me into a manager, and I just want to be a shepherd. And because of my work, some people feel like I'm going to say, that's great. That's, my, that's what I'm all about. I'm, I'm all about this movement to rescue the shepherd. Well, I am. But that's not to get rid of management. It's not to get you out of, con uh, out of conflict. It's not to get you out of human resources. Some pastors are saying, I need someone else to do the hiring and firing so I can do the shepherding. So this will probably be good for Q&A. I assume you might disagree with me. But I don't think that the image that's portrayed in the Bible, which resonates with the image in the ancient Near East, was ever one that divided those two. But in fact, the shepherd image itself brought them together. When Hammurabi, a king of a huge empire, called himself shepherd, 
It was both as someone who fed people, made them lie down in green pastures, and someone whom they could trust to bring justice and order by his might. And he used the word shepherd for both aspects. So at least hang in there a little bit, and then we can have some back and forth on this and see whether or not God might be speaking to you about whether or not you have a built-in preference. Some of you, of course, uh, go into ministry because for your whole lives you've been oriented towards human need. And there can be a downside to that, which is people-pleasing. Others of you were sort of born policemen, born security guards. You're suspicious and protective and you're, you, you know, you maybe think that other people are just naive. And the, and the dark side of that can be cynicism and a lack of concern. And, and the biblical shepherd isn't one that just delegates all this other stuff out. It's one that has them together. Because I think part of what's at risk is something theological. And it's whether or not we understand love and justice. So hang with me for a minute. God seeks co- courageous not just compassionate, but courageous and vigilant shepherds who secure his people with protection. People need sustenance, but they need security. People need provision, they also need protection. People need you to be courageous as well as compassionate. The familiar image in Psalm 23 is walking through the valley of the shadow of death. I will fear no evil for your rod and your staff. They comfort me. The first part of the psalm pictures the shepherd at the first part of the day. The sun shining, and I'm out eating. I'm out getting water. I'm getting my needs met. When the dusk comes at the end of the afternoon, all of that feeding, all of that watering is a waste if you're still not my shepherd there to protect me. Because at dusk, a whole group of predators in the wilderness, emerge on the horizon. They emerge on the cliffs and on the tops of the valley walls. And the only thing on their menu that they want is sheep or goat. That's what they live for. They're predators. They're nocturnal carnivores. Hyenas, wolves, panthers, and David's Day lions. Animals that make this environment not only inhospitable, but hostile. And that's the world in which we serve as shepherds. To pastor is to shepherd in an environment that is not waiting to give people what they need. And even worse, it's an environment that's not waiting to find ways to protect people. Rather, it's an environment that has all kinds of substitutes for what people need, and it's got predators waiting for them when they're vulnerable. And unfortunately, like sheep, we are prone to wander. That's the hymn I could hear the flocks humming, by the way. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. That's what I could hear in the Middle East, because that's something the Bible does say. People like sheep tend to wander. And the shepherd's job is to make sure they don't to make sure they don't drift out of sight and into the arms of the waiting predators. So here's a picture that you might imagine is common, because, of course, David needed to spend most of his time writing poetry. So the sheep are always lying around. Well, most shepherds aren't spending a lot of time sitting around. And if they have a lot of goats, they don't sit down at all, because the animals are always moving. And even if you sit down for tea... Someone has to take turns every 10 minutes or so and make sure that the sheep that have drifted get back because they kind of move together. It's a little imperceptible, something like a cloud. You have to kind of look more than once to realize it's moved. That's the way they are. And they do. They tend to wander. They tend to scatter. And these are incredibly theological words in the Bible. God's people get scattered. They wander and get scattered. And the verbs that are used for wandering in the Old and New Testament are words that in certain forms are used for people who mislead. So in other words, our tendency, our built-in tendency 
to wander is co-opted when, when uh, malevolent leadership gets involved and it leads them in the wrong places. And this is what Ezekiel 34 is all about. God's shepherds have actually uh, satisfied their own needs as shepherds. And then meanwhile, the sheep have just drifted off to become food for predators. They became food when they, when they scattered. And so one kind of sobering uh, note that you probably have to sit with for a while is that in the world of biblical leadership, understood the way shepherds understand it, neglect is abuse. There are certainly social and domestic situations that we know of where we would say that would be true. Somebody leaves a child in a car, doesn't realize that they can't breathe, that it's hot and all that. Why do we hold them responsible? Because we understand the connection. My ignorant neglect is still not an excuse because I'm responsible. And responsibility is at the heart of shepherding. And if you live in a hostile environment, you can't be asleep at the switch. I have another story in the, in the illustrated book about a guy who went home and... Um, when he came back, one of the hired shepherds was in big trouble because he'd lost one of the sheep. He said that he's never going to hear the end of this because this is what you're responsible for. And the guy had fallen asleep. He'd gone home to take care of some things at the house, and his wife had given him all kinds of chores, you know, the honey-do list. And he came back, and he fell asleep when he was on night duty. And a hyena came in and took some of the animals away. It's not acceptable. This is the family business. The, the economics depend on alert, attentive behavior with skill. Not just that you hold the club, but you know how to use it. Of course, today what they use is an AK-47 or a, an Uzi. But the Bible talks in this section, we're talking about protection. One of the most common uh, images for, for predators are wolves. So think by extension, figuratively, about any kind of predator because they show up in the Bible. Uh, people that are, are false teachers in the Bible are predators. So the wolves are most often, the, that's the name that's used for them. But what are false teachers known for in the Bible? Well, if you kind of go through your cable television options, you'll see the whole gamut. Financial, predatorial behavior, heretical teaching, just pure heretical teaching. But you'll also see that there's uh, sex, sexual scandals associated with certain kinds of movements that always run alongside the church. Any way that people can be taken advantage of, they regularly get taken advantage of by wolves. And wolves are often in sheep's clothing in the church. It would be very unusual in the history of the church if you lived in a congregation and you said, well, we've got 150, 250 people in our church and everybody's a growing Christian, I doubt that because it seems as though at every moment in the history of the, the people of God in the Bible and from what I can read in church history, the church has never existed without threats of all kinds. There's always false teaching. There's always people that are looking for, to take advantage of people's money, to take advantage of them sexually, to bring them into some dis, disfigured kind of Christianity. We are always at risk because we are living in a wilderness. That's where we serve. And the wolf becomes sort of the archetype of this kind of menace. And so it would be naive to be simply a compassionate, people-pleasing servant and this is one of the concerns I have when servant leadership is the only way that you ever hyphenate the word leadership, is that it removes protection, it removes authority, it removes hard decision-making out of the equation in the name of Jesus' great uh, towel and basin moment. But that's not the only way to talk about leadership in the Bible. And certainly when Jesus sent his disciples out, he said, I'm going to send you out like sheep among wolves. There is a sacrificial dimension to being shepherds. He said, when you go out, I want you to be as wise as serpents and gentle as doves. There again, the staff and the rod, the, 
the shepherd who has the, the, you could say the bleeding heart, and the shepherd who has the courageous heart. It's both. And I just think part of what God is telling us in this image over and over again is, is be balanced, have the capacity to be both. Can we, and this is what I think is so phenomenal about the challenge of pastoral ministry, is that you will inevitably go one day from a bedside of somebody suffering from a terminal disease only to grab a quick bite to eat on your way to a board meeting when you're discussing a capital campaign. The, the degree of swivel in your life from one role to another, from one task to another, requires you to have more than one kind of heart. You know, this idea, I, I'll give you shepherds after my own heart, I, I was trying to figure out what I was hearing through translators because they kept talking about the heart and I kept thinking about the compassionate side. And one day one of them said, my brother is, and the translator said, he's saying he's stout of heart. And I said, what does that mean? He said he slept in a cave where he knew there were hyena droppings. That's how you know my brother's really got a heart for shepherding. And I was thinking, well, how do you get both of these when you see a little lamb or a kid that goes against their leg and they pat it and you say, these people are there at birth. They're there at sickness. They'll go looking for them. They've got a soft side. But boy, they also feel very comfortable when it gets dark at night. They feel comfortable with their weapons. They feel comfortable with the predators. One of my guys that was translating for me had grown up not in a Bedouin family, but he'd grown up with a father who had been a, uh, a transient herder. He said, you know, you've been asking all these Bedouin stories about, about you know, wolves and predators and all that. He said, you know, one night my father was out sleeping, and they have these really full-length wool coats that they wear. They're, they're sort of like a blanket that you can just wrap yourself in. And that's all they do, just lie down on the ground when they're out in an open field, and the sheep and the goats will be around them. There'll be a donkey and some other animals that have been... Uh, trained to kind of represent the shepherd. They're sort of adjuncts. And so when they're together, you don't have to have a tent, you don't have to have anything else, but you can just stay there. The shepherd's right there. And I've sometimes seen a big circle of sheep on a field, and as we move closer to them, all of a sudden, right in the middle, I'll see somebody get up from the ground. And my driver said, you know, my father was sleeping one night on the ground with his wool coat, and he said, you know, hyenas, they don't see very well. They're nocturnal, but that doesn't mean they see well at night. That's just when they're active. And he said, one of these hyenas came up, and hyenas, by the way, have jaws that are like, you know, caterpillar. You know, they, they just crunch right through anything. And he said, the hyena was sniffing my father because he could smell the wool. It's kind of like the Esau story, right? What exactly am I smelling right now? And this hyena was trying to decide what this thing was. Was it a human, which he may not be able to take on, or was it a sheep? Well, they have this knife called the shabria, and this, his father took out the shabria, and he went like this to the hyena, while the hyena had bitten into the coat. So then, just like Joseph, he runs off, leaving the coat behind, okay? And what does he do? He goes back to get his knife and his coat, and he finishes off the hyena, gets his coat back. And this is like part of the lore of... of uh, and I know, Lawson, you've been in this world, so you have your own stories, I'm sure, to tell. John Monson, and I know other people that have lived in this world, spent lots of time in this. Stories after stories like that. Now, I've never met a church that relished church discipline. Or if they did, uh, made me feel good about the church. Nobody should like that. So I'm not saying that we ought to have the bravado of how many people you kicked out, how many people that you disciplined. There's a, there's a dark side to that. But, but there are lots of churches that don't have the capacity to exercise discipline, either by virtue of the way they view membership, or really, to put it differently, the way they have removed membership from the identity of the church's life. Or they have simply taken an approach that people are customers and they need to be served well. And discipline just doesn't even fit into the culture of the church. I want to take you to a moment in Paul's life where I think what Paul said is incredibly provocative and I think would have been unexpected and maybe even viewed inappropriately. Paul is on his last voyage. He's on his way to Rome. 
So in the back of your Bibles, all the missionary trips, they're all, this is Paul's last line. This one's going from Caesarea all the way to Rome. And he stops in Miletus, southwest Turkey. And the Ephesus, the, the Ephesian elders come down to Miletus to meet him. He's, he's in a kind of a house arrest type mode. So he, he can entertain people. And the Ephesian church was a church where arguably Paul spent more time than any other, with, with any other group. Certainly among the top two churches where people would have had the most personal history with Mr. Rapid Fire Church Planter, right? I mean, a lot of people could have said, who's Paul again? I mean, the, the number of uh, congregations that suffered from, from other you know, usurpers of uh, apostolic authority sometimes took advantage of Paul's brevity and visit. But if Ephesus, Paul spent a long time, months and months, every day teaching. And the elders come to meet with him, and they know, by prophecy, they, they know that Paul is going to be going to Rome, and that's the end of his life that's waiting for him. They know, it says, that this will be the last time they'll see him. And it's at that moment that Paul says to them, not how much he loves them and how much it's just great to reminisce about all the good things that happened. He capitalizes on that moment to say, beware. Beware. He says it at the beginning and at the end of this passage. Beware or keep watch over yourselves. Be on your guard. He, he sort of creates those bookends. And in the middle he says, because I know that savage wolves will come in among you. And he even says something more profound. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. In other words, Paul's saying, you as a congregation, you as a flock, you're, even this leadership group, this core is vulnerable, and there's nothing more important for me to talk about right now than that. But I want to tell you something worse, and that is that you can't even trust yourselves. That's why Paul says, be on your guard, beware, because it's not only the wolves outside, which we sometimes find easy to identify. You can always label somebody that's far enough away that's clearly a wolf, and then you can say, well, yeah, we know there's wolves. But Paul said it can happen inside. And you've got to be able to look in the mirror and know when you started growing whiskers, right? You have to know when something started to happen and the wolf within starts to emerge. I watched it happen to a close colleague in ministry. And I saw a person who was my fellow worker become a wolf. One of my doctoral ministry students one time said he had a student, uh, a, a youth group, leader come to his door one night at dinner time and he said, I really got to talk to you. And he said, well, it's dinner time. Can it wait? He said, no. He said, I really want to talk to you now. And he said, after a little bit of back and forth, he went out on the front steps and he said, well, okay, what is it? He said, well, I, I'm in trouble. And, he, and the pastor said to him, well, look, you know, I am totally committed to you. No matter what it is, I'm on your side. You can depend on me. And the youth group leader said, the police have a warrant for my arrest. He said, what for? He said, for child molestation. Now, what happens inside your mind when you're a pastor and you make a glib, in retrospect, a glib, unconditional promise to protect somebody who, by the way, is shepherding a youth group that has two of your own daughters in it? It changes things a little bit, doesn't it? Well, that's the way Paul felt about the congregation. Now, again... If you tend towards the naive side, then Paul needs to shake you up and say, don't trust anybody. If you're the kind of person who was born saying, I don't trust anybody, then of course Paul needs to shake you up and say, let it go. Trust God. It's not up to you. You're not the only one in charge of orthodoxy for the whole, for all of Christendom. You're not the only one who's the policeman for God, you know, because it starts to become like the Gestapo. And that's not good for the church either. But again, hear the, the kind of image, let the image of the shepherd hold this together for you. A church that goes in a healthy way through discipline will be able to excise members, but it will be painful. Just like it was for Jesus to be able to look at somebody like Judas and understand what's going on, to live with that and then eventually let it play itself out the way it did. So be on your guard, these words that come from this passage, especially for the wolf within. And actually, I think this is one of the ways that we can temper the tendency to go overboard with wolves 
is that constant awareness that sometimes it can be within. I'll skip over a few pictures about gates. You know the passage in John 10 includes a section about being a gate and, of course, being a gatekeeper. I want to take you to the third section before we have our Q&A time, and that is competence. I'm sorry, guidance. And if you think about courage and compassion, add to it competence. And I'll say God's wa- God seeks wise and competent shepherds who guide his people, provide, protect, and guide his people in this case, with a shared mission. And, of course, there's leading and guiding language in Psalm 23. I want to just turn your attention to that phrase, he guides me in paths of righteousness, and give you some idea of the landscape. But first, a view from the flock, okay? Here's what it really looks like when you're one of the flock, okay? You, you really can't see more than about 30 feet ahead as, as one of, you know, a sheep or a goat, Uh, physiologically, but you actually don't need to because you move as a group. In fact, there was an article that came out about some Turkish shepherds uh, in Turkey where several of them got together for a coffee break and their combined flock was over, uh, flocks together were over 1,500 animals. And while they were having coffee, somehow only one of the animals uh, began a movement unintentionally started to move in a way that seemed to be a signal to the other animals that they were moving. And as that huge crowd of animals started to follow a non-leader, they created enough noise that nobody could hear the shepherds or the dogs yelling, and that ewe led 1,500 animals off a cliff. Hundreds of them died because they are prone to wander, and they are also uh, easily misled. The good news to the story is that after the first 450 died, the rest of them landed on this huge wool mattress, and they actually lived. But, I, you know, I don't want to introduce too much levity because this is a hostile environment for guidance, too. The paths that you can see carved into this picture are sometimes on, on sheer cliffs, And all paths are not safe paths in the wilderness. All a path means is somebody was here before you. It doesn't mean they got anywhere good. Some paths lead off a cliff. Some of them lead in circles. There are no guarantees if you're following a tail, and there are no guarantees if you're on a well-worn trail. You have to have a shepherd lead you. And this idea of trails of righteousness is very graphic. These are ruts, which I call righteous ruts. And I think one of our responsibilities as leaders is to guide people, like the psalmist says about God, guide them in righteous ruts, which, which is the way the Torah itself is meant to be for people. It wasn't meant to be legalistically implemented with a mentality that you would somehow be jacking up your own righteousness, but it was a righteous trail. And God kept saying to them, don't you understand, if you stay on this trail, you'll have life. God knows where all the other trails go, and that's part of what leadership is, not just feeding, not just protecting, but guiding people on a path that leads somewhere, and it leads to life. And of course, the life that Jesus promised, that God promised, it's an abundant life. John 10, he uses that language And guidance itself aims toward that place where a flock that's well-fed and uh, well-protected multiplies. It bears fruit, whether that means reproduction or production. There's wool, there's all the fiber products, all the milk products. This is the stuff of the shepherd's life, and it's the stuff of our churches. When people are thriving... And they're producing fruit, you can usually be sure that there's been some good feeding and that there's been some good protecting. Because sustenance and security are the means to get us into an environment where people can be uh, put on a path that leads to life. Here's a picture of some of the products, including some cheese that lasts for at least 10 years. Just add water, keep it in your camel bag. Wool, 
people are not only naturally uh, able to be misled, sometimes uh, prone not only to wander, but, but really easy, easily follow someone else. But they're also, it's just natural for them, when they're well-fed, when they're protected, they are at ease, they produce. They don't try to make wool. They don't try to make babies. When they're well cared for, they just do. Anybody that wants to make them productive will do these other things because it's what's natural. Get them into an environment that's free from anxiety, that's free from threats, that is full of nutrition, and this is what will happen. I want to just give you one last footnote on guidance. If guidance is answering the question, uh, to what end? God calls shepherds. To what end? Where, where are we leading people? Is it to the next five-year strategic plan? Is it to the next building expansion? What is it? One of the pieces of biblical leadership tied to the shepherd image that doesn't show up in any secular book, and it wouldn't, and you'll understand why, is that shepherding language is linked to a bigger uh, kind of theological trend in the Bible that we sometimes call the Exodus and the second Exodus. God is himself leading his people through the journey of life in this world where his people are on the perimeter. They're on the margins of this settled world where people mistakenly believe there's permanence in their big concrete buildings and in their portfolios and everything else that screams, this is here to stay. God's people are on the fringes of that civilization the best list of them is in Hebrews 11. People who literally sometimes live with animal skins in caves because those are the people of whom the world isn't worthy because it's by their very lifestyle on the margins of this society, not ignoring this society, but their perception of themselves is that this world is not my home, as the song goes. I'm just a passing through. There's something nomadic about God's people. And when we get to heaven, we're going to find ourselves in the ultimate desert, the Garden of Eden. Paradise sits in the desert. It's the table God puts before his people, and he serves us as the shepherd, as the lamb, as the shade. He does it all in Revelation 7. So whether or not your tent has some modern accoutrements in it, whether or not your church facility maybe looks as good as the next building that's, you know, that has people in it who believe it'll last forever, mistakenly. This is who we are, and it was built into Israel's own ritual. Every year at first fruits, when once nomads who had become farmers would be bringing their farm crops in for the te- the, to the temple for the first fruits, they would say, my father was a wandering Aramean who went down to Egypt and sojourned there a while. Fabulous. Doesn't sound like the Nicene Creed, the Apostles' Creed, or any other creed that we know, but it was a fabulous creedal statement that centered every uh, settled Israelite in, in their identity as a child of the, of the shepherd Abraham and his son Jacob, renamed Israel, These are the ones that are the patriarchs of those who only for a time live on this earth and like Abraham know that there's a city whose foundations are permanent and they're not in this world. And that's how Psalm 23 ends. And these are the words that I'll end with. Uh, Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That's the paradise to which we all go. My, My life is an experience of God's provision for me on the margins of settled society where people mistakenly believe that this is all there is. And when I serve as God's under-shepherd, I communicate that vision to them, and I lead them home. That's the ultimate goal.
thank you very much. Uh, sure. Very uh, thought-provoking. Um, and uh, now would be a time to ask some questions. Uh, as you're thinking uh, about them, uh, there's uh, one a mic over here, and there will be another one over here. Um, let me let me begin, uh, maybe to prime the pump just a little bit. I'm going to pick on the question you said that should be uh, in the Q&A. Uh, you talked about the, the shepherd, and there's both a, a leading aspect to that and a soul care or a uh, more compassionate aspect to that. And we have really bifurcated the two. And so there's the shepherding notion that is more the compassionate side, and then there's the executive or the management or the leadership side. Now, in light of that, uh, I'm agreeing with you, but, but I'm, I'm wrestling with, okay, so what does that have to do with gifting? Mm -hmm. And what does that have to do with size of, of uh, the flock that we have? Yeah. Um, and, 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 and how does that uh, affect, uh, or how is it affected by our own sin? Yeah and uh, other yeah. things, limitations with which we live. Mm -hmm. So if you would be yeah. kind enough to address that, that would be so helpful. Did you all hear that in the back? Okay, hearing that? Um, with all of these topics, it, I mean, it's really helpful to have some, some, some feedback so that we kind of reshape together before we go where things might get overstated. The church is meant to be built around our gifts. And there's nothing necessarily wrong or unbiblical about somebody saying, I want to stay close to my gift set. So when, for example, a pastor says, I, you know, I'm called to be a teacher and I'm not called to be an administrator and the church has gotten too big for that, not, nothing inherently wrong with that. And it may be the, the, the very best biblical and spiritual response to an awareness of gifting. What I'm trying to get at is when we're sometimes running away from some aspect of the role set that is pastor. So, uh, you know, I've heard different responses sometimes. I, I've heard people say, uh, well, look, I, I'm not a shepherd anymore. I'm a rancher. So that's one way to deal with the size thing is to say, well, I'm, I'm sort of remote shepherd. And I've dealt with mission groups where people are regional directors and they have say, this, this is remote shepherding. So there's certainly a kind of stratification that necessarily takes place uh, should you choose to have a large flock, if you want to have satellite churches, you're going to have much more of a bureaucratic layering uh, because you can't, you can't manage it all from one place. Um, that, that is an if, though. Uh, that's a choice to go to that layer. And there's nothing unbiblical about having a large church. And, in fact, herds in the ancient world were often in tens of thousands. So they had names for different kinds of shepherds who had management responsibilities for them. So nothing inherently wrong, I'm, but when I think, when I personally sense that somebody doesn't want to do the hard things uh, because it doesn't feel loving, then I think there's something going on theologically about their notion of love. When I see a church wrestle through discipline when it sort of runs against the grain of their own compassion that's when I think it's done best. That's when I really feel like this is exhibit A. I was with a church in Singapore. They'd spent night after night dealing with one discipline issue. And they were all haggard just from all of the late night, the discussions, all the concerns, legal, marital, all this. They were caring people, and they didn't give up when the, when the going got tough. And so when I compare that with someone who says, you know what? I just don't have the stomach for letting somebody go, then I don't feel like what I'm hearing is a true awareness of the multiplicity of gifts. And this is probably a hot issue for many of you. I see, and I want more research on this to, to know to what extent this is true, so I'll just create a caricature, but I see people leaving the business world, uh, and of course, since 2008, things have changed, but, but people that have sort of made made it possible financially to retire mid midlife and you know they've read halftime or something else or somebody's inspired them and they they want to make their life useful and they say, I've got an MBA or at least a successful business career and when they're moving towards the church I see it I see pastors moving to them and it's like magnets 
you're just what I want. And they're saying, you're just what I want. I want to do management with meaning. I want to have my life count. And these other folks are saying, I need somebody to administer and manage the, this place. And there's not, uh, there's not always a mechanism to bring the theological perspective of the pastor into the world. So uh, I'm sort of creating this scenario, but there's not always that mechanism to help that person understand the extent to which that business acumen, that kind of managerial skill is helpful and the extent to which it's dangerous for the church. And at the same time, the pastor may not be letting himself or herself be trained to have that perspective. Because after all, if you are responsible for a group of people and every time the budget comes out, you glaze over like most of the people on the board and assume that two or three people that know finance are going to make the decisions, you've abdicated. We think it's okay to be forced to learn Greek and Hebrew and all that, but I, I can't read a budget, I can't read a spreadsheet. We have to get over some of those things and not just relegate them too quickly. So, uh, Another question. I appreciate it, by the way, the distinction between gifting and role. Yeah, right. That was, that was very because helpful. Because, you know, when I asked shepherds, sometimes I'd say, you know, what do you look for most in a shepherd? One of them was the most profound in his simplicity. We, we're looking for people that will do anything we ask them and work hard. <laughs> and it was, again, I felt like I heard God speaking through the translator. God wants people to know their gifts so they're not mismatched to his plan. But he also needs people that fix the toilet without saying, that's not my gift set. And unfortunately, we start to do that with a lot of things and sort of move away. So, Thank go you. ahead. Just a comment on the um, significance of call, pastoral call. It's a, it's a big topic. Um, I, I think I'll, maybe I'll just say something that might be a little provocative, but I my sense is that there's been a tendency in the church to take the exceptional stories of calling in the Bible and make them paradigmatic. And uh, I don't know if you've ever heard anyone uh, preach a sermon on calling and talk about Joshua. Moses makes a much better story, right? Everyone would rather hear about a burning bush than about Joshua. How many people have heard a story about Timothy's calling haven't you heard more about Paul? Because the Damascus Road carries a lot more freight. But it's actually nurturing Timothy in the home and having the awareness of his gifts in that familial context that may very well have been the, the dominant uh, normal way of being called. And I want, so I don't know where you were headed with your question, and maybe I went in a different direction, but it's one of the concerns I have. Sometimes I think uh, calling is is when the people in the church, uh, the, when the elders, for example, say, we really believe that God has his hand in your life and you might resist and have to pray about it, but it's that tap on the shoulder. When Mordecai said to Esther, for such a time as this, look at your circumstances. You're the one. And when people point that out to you, it may be coming from the outside. It might be coming from a series of circumstances. But I just, even in a seminary, I, I feel hesitant to exalt a notion, which I'll even be heretical enough to say, it's not technically biblical. The, the way we use the word calling, we have brought it up to a level where we have crystallized and fossilized the notion of calling. And we've set people up, I think, sometimes to get to a point where they felt called and they went to seminary. And then, and then they're kind of wondering, what does the call mean when they go to the first church? And then if things sort of fizzle, they don't know what the rest of their life means. So... I, Maybe I'll just keep getting myself in trouble and then walk out the back. But I, I do think it would be helpful to rescue, right, okay, <laughs> but to rescue the word calling and pull it back into the, into the language of obedience. Because obedience is a lifetime of following. And when God calls us dramatically or undramatically into forms of service, whether they be full-time or not, I don't think that should overwhelm us. Uh, to the point where we forget that we have a lifetime of obedience that will include other things. Everyone that teaches on the Charlotte campus is doing something different than what they thought they were called to. And we decided to be honest with our students. 
that what you think you're called to may not be what you'll end up doing 20 or 30 years later. Thank you. Does that get to the heart of it, Lee? What prompted it in the first place? Are you, are you concerned about some notion of calling or some mystical sort of calling? Some what? what? Here, hang on. This this right. this will be taped. Let's let's have you speak. When you talked about your, you know, the son has a heart for it. I tend to think that the calling is when you have the heart for it, and not everybody who loves the church or likes to care for people. That there, for me, there was a very clear sense of call. I don't think of it particularly dramatic, one way or the other. But you know, the businessman that's coming in. It, it, there's a shepherd call. I think it's the shepherd heart is the call. Mm. And that's what I was trying to kind of get my hands around. Okay. Thank you. Good. Another question. I'll ask one while people are thinking about questions. Uh, I'm not sure this has to do with the shepherd metaphor per se, but you made a pretty helpful pointed comment about church discipline in the middle of your talk that made me think I wonder if he's got some more biblical wisdom for us on the topic of church discipline. It's such a difficult thing to manage well. Probably most of us simply neglect to, to do it well. We all know examples of people who are overly controlling and maybe spiritually mature who, who do it but maybe not so well. Is there anything from your study of scripture or from your reflection on the the, the shepherding metaphor that you could provide for us by way of wisdom in this really difficult, particularly yeah. North American, but all over the place. Yeah. You know, we're in such a difficult context now to do church discipline well. Yeah. Do you have some advice? Yeah. Well, I, I think um, what I've said, I'll just maybe highlight a couple things um, to amplify them, and that is, one is, if our leadership is defined too much by who we think we are, uh, how we think we're gifted, you know, how, what we think we're called to. We may sometimes set ourselves up with limits on how God may want to use us in situations, especially if there's some things that are hard and discipline is hard. So I'd say one issue is let God speak to you. I, I don't know. Some of you may have sort of an inner Nazi, and some of you may have an inner nursery school teacher, you know? And so I, that's the nature of this metaphor is that it has to kind of go to both sides with you and say, can you be a little more this way to kind of get a sense of, of the both end? Um, on a very practical level that's biblical, I've worked closely with Peacemaker Ministries, and I'll be with their annual conference again next week, and we developed a resource called the Leadership opportunity that includes some of this in it. They're sort of a group of lawyers that, you know, found themselves with a whole lot of conflict in the church and in marriages, and they've developed very biblical, very practical ways for people to deal with conflict. And the issue about membership that I, that I did kind of talk about in passing is something that I have uh, seen through their eyes. And I realize that if we don't construct our communities with certain kinds of bylaws, procedures, uh, et cetera, in place. And some of you have denominations that provide this. But in independent churches, when people believe they're sort of starting from scratch with the New Testament, boy, there's a lot of things that they don't take advantage of in terms of collective wisdom. If you don't get it right to begin with, then you don't create the opportunity to discipline later. I'll, I'll confess something, even though this is being taped, but my wife and I were short-term missionaries in Greece um, in a culture where boys could sort of get away with murder growing up. And we were living with a family that was hosting us. We were working with them. And uh, they had a boy that was a terror. And um, he just got away with anything. And one night we were sitting at the dinner table, and he just walked, punched my wife right in the kidneys. And she's an elementary ed teacher. She could see spoiled brat written all over this kid from the day we came there. And she just sort of turned around, took his hand, and went like this. And his parents... The family who's hosting us in their country and their home just about, you know, stop breathing. The audacity of it. Well, why? She didn't have the right to be disciplining someone else's child. Well, that's the way people feel in churches when the structure isn't in place. Nobody signs anything. 
in some settings, if, if you're not asked to sign something, if you don't post something, Peacemaker Ministries actually recommends that you not only have very clear membership guidelines that include uh, if a, that you cannot revoke, you, you cannot yourself initiate your own dismembering, or what, I don't know a better way to say that, right? Not, you, you, you can always dismember yourself if you just have a kitchen, kitchen accident, but you can't take yourself off the membership rolls if a disciplinary process has begun. So that's already written there when you sign up. But they also have another statement that's public in the church that says, anybody who is a regular attender defined by being here more than three to five times is subject to the church's general disciplinary procedures found at such and such a site. So I, I, I'm really impressed with the commitment to say, let's create a community where you know that people are here to have peace, and the only way to get peace is to have a plan for conflict, and that does involve discipline at times. But of course, if you, if you look at what Peacemaker is doing, and if you think biblically about it, the goal is always restoration. The goal isn't just to excommunicate as many people as cause trouble as possible. Thank you. Uh, here, question, please. Hi. Uh, earlier you mentioned about the problem of biblical illiteracy mm -hmm. um, and also that those people need to be eased in while they detox into literacy. Mm -hmm. What are some ways that you would suggest that would that'd be a good way to do that? Well, a couple come to mind because it's what we're trying to do programmatically, or at least I, I am. One of them is to, is to sort of uh, put into bite size what, is, uh, what has historically been available to people in larger doses. So, for example, an Old Testament survey at Trinity, probably a, a three-semester-hour course, if somebody uh, out in the community uh, were to sit in on that class, they might say, whoa, this is way over my head, I can't do it. We're trying to take that and spread it out into bits so that people have two hours on a weeknight like they would with a Bible study, but they're introduced to the Bible in its literary and historical and theological context, and they have teaching assistants that work with them so that they can start to manage understanding the Bible with sort of um, shorter time frames for being able to experience the meaning and the connectedness. People can hold their breath longer in a graduate program, right? They'll, they'll wait it out. They understood that coming in. Another one is that I just, I personally challenge pastors to find every possible way to sneak uh, the big picture of the Bible into comments that you make about anything in the Bible. It, I, I, I sense that so many times when, when, uh, when and, and I preach a lot too, so I'll just say we, but I sense a lot of times when we preach, we feel like if we're going to start talking about something that's unfamiliar in the Bible, We've got a fairly short window of time to give people any kind of information that they may not think is relevant. And sometimes what we do is we sort of color it up anachronistically. And it's sort of like you talk about Gideon and you think he's playing in the Red, he's playing in the, you know, the World Series or something. And it's like we just... So I really want to encourage us to do good work with people, when, sort of expand that attention with really rich, pertinent background so they can see the relevance of it, but they start to become curious. We have to, we have to sort of pump uh, kind of their interest into that curiosity. And the second thing is its connectedness to the whole Bible. So if, they, if, if you just show PowerPoints of Scripture on the screen, that's the kind of Bible that most people have. Even, I mean, right now the electronic Bible is it's, it's, it's on its way to become the most used Bible in whatever form. It, it's always contextless. Now, you can argue that's the way scrolls were. I mean, there's lots of different ways to look at it. But what is clear is that people are losing a grip on how the Bible is connected to it. So I think we have to... Uh, so this is a, kind of sounds like a, a very superficial answer. I think we have to keep tucking in as much as we can so that if I'm going to reference Gideon, I may just simply say, for those of you that are unfamiliar, Gideon's in the book of Judges in the Bible, and the book of Judges is, is it's a collection of stories that follow the same storyline. And what I've done is I've made it possible, once I've talked about Gideon, to say, you can get more of this if you go to this site and click here, so to speak, right? So I, I just think enormous task. The Bible has become bits. Thank you. 
Uh, one more question, and we will. This will be our final question. Thank you. Yes, my question is uh, turning your subtitle into a question. Uh, your subtitle is the enduring challenge of the pastoral identity, but how does one endure the challenge of that pastoral <laughs> uh, identity? And maybe you can extend your metaphor in terms of what the hard work that the pastor needs to do. Um, yeah. How extend that metaphor in terms of what pastors do in order to continue in that work? Yeah, good. It's a great question. I, there, there, there is. A, I, I grew up uh, assuming that I was called to be a missionary. Um, I had the chance to do a lot of cross-cultural work, but I can truly say, as much as I admire missionaries, I, my heart goes out to the people that spend their time with their primary designation in life being pastor or minister or priest in this world. It's, a, it's an incredibly diverse challenge, and the landscape keeps changing, the expectations do. So we, you know, as I did each one of these books, I gathered a whole group of pastors together, and they just read together, they talked together, and I've been in pastors' prayer groups where they've uh, sort of helped each other stay on course the, uh, I think you have, to, you have to choose the venues that you think really do hit the reset button on, on what you believe is your pastoral identity. There are conference-based ministries out there that may help, and a lot of churches will give their staff the opportunity or volunteers to sort of pick whatever they do. Th- th- those won't necessarily be opportunities that really drive them back to a biblical understanding of their role. It might be how to better run small groups or how to better manage, you know, certain things that maybe are really pressing. So what I have really appreciated, and this is sort of at its, at its best at the doctor of ministry level, is when people come together and there's trust and there's confidentiality and there's a base there's a base level of knowledge and commitment. When people get together like that, they can really come back in touch with who they are. And then after that, they don't need any more degrees. They just they have found the group that for the rest of their lives will always help them remember. And so I, I do have forums where I have people talk about, I mean, every chapter in this illustrated book has forums, and there's just lots of people that want to think out loud together about how to be a shepherd when there's really not much in our world calling us to be a shepherd. It's a kind of a, it's, it's a, it's a metaphor that doesn't work for a lot of people. And so if you say, well, it really means pastor, you know, if you want to work it the other way and say, well, yeah, you know what it means. It means pastor. That doesn't get you very far because what does pastor mean? It means everything that everyone thinks it means. So, but you know, I mean, there are people to whom you'll look, some of you will resonate with Eugene Peterson. He just wrote his memoirs, the pastor, if that helps reset it, you know, give out copies to people. The, the attrition rate out of the pastorate is just horrific. I mean, three to five years, people are leaving the field. And so, I, I mean, it's, it's just as bad as people trying to stay in uh, foreign missionary service. So you've got to cling to whatever is helping you stay connected. And I would say that, the, um, that you know, there's everyone will have maybe some, something different on their reading list. But we definitely have to be reading uh, the kind of uh, stuff that puts us in touch with who we are as pastors and not just the kind of stuff that helps us get the job done. Because sometimes that's actually pulling us away from a pastoral identity. And I know that's what Eugene Peterson, uh, in, in, in his own journey, finally realized, is that you just simply have to say it I'm a pastor, and that means that I pray for you, and I'm attentive to God's work in your life. If that doesn't work for you, fine, but I know that's what my role is. It doesn't look like a whole job. It looks like I just work two hours a week, I know, right? But I know that's my job, and if you get pulled too far away from being able to do that, and of course, this gets back to the first question, you still have to do what needs to be done, but you can also draw the line and say, I've, I've lost, I've lost my, my sense of shepherding. Thank you. Let's uh, thank uh, Dr. Laniak.